Welcome to your 2023 work recap. This year, you've been to 127 sync meetings. You spent 56 minutes searching for files and almost missed eight deadlines. Yikes. 2024 can and should sound different. With Monday.com, you can work together easily, collaborate and share data, files, and updates. So all work happens in one place and everyone's on the same page. Go to Monday.com or tap the banner to learn more. A science story, huh? Did NYU scientists, they felt the right. So and I just thought, well, I figured it, wow. out. I it was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's storyteller is Robin Abrams. The story was recorded in December 2012 at the Oberon in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The theme of the event was, It Takes Guts. So, I'm nine years old, and the next door neighbor comes over with a big cardboard box. In the box, handfuls of freshly mown grass. On the grass, two little baby rabbits, small enough to fit in the palm of my hand. Do I want them, he says. He was out in his yard and had picked them up without thinking twice, and now he realized that his mother might reject them. Do I want to try my hand at raising them? Do you not understand that I am a nine-year-old girl? (laughs) Some distinct and more alto part of my mind says, as the rest of me shrieks agreement in a pitch so high that a neighborhood dog started to bark down the block. Of course I want the bunnies! (laughs) My mother wanted to sue the guy. She was a Depression-era baby born in Queens, When it came to animals, she was like some primitive who didn't categorize them according to their mode of locomotion or their dietary requirements, but only according to their ritual cleanliness or uncleanliness. There were the horses in Central Park, which were nice. There was everything else, which was not nice. (laughs) Intellectually, she could distinguish between species. I was taught that the kitty said meow, meow, and the dog said woof, woof, just like any normal child. But emotionally to her, everything was either a horse or a cockroach. (laughs) She was furious that I was bringing these not nice baby rabbits into her clean home. And she exacted revenge on me by telling me in graphic detail exactly why the neighbor picked them up in the first place and the connection between the unusually small size of the litter and the handfuls of freshly mown grass in the box. Oh, the horror, the rabbinity, guts. Which, on a metaphorical level, one of my little rabbits had to a far greater extent than the other. One of them, if I put my hand into the box, would crawl into my hand, happy to be petted, to eat food right off my fingertips. The other one would race in panicky circles. My footprints signaled terror. He treated me like a war criminal. The other was the fat, happy bunny Buddha of his cardboard world. When the time came for me to release them, to turn that box over in an empty lot, one of them made an immediate mad dash to freedom, The other lingered in the only home he had ever known until my mother kicked the bottom of the box. Two rabbits, the same rabbity upbringing, the same nightmarish slaughter, the same miraculous rescue. And they were so tiny, their little brains no bigger than pencil erasers. And thus a psychologist was born. Everything I had ever noticed about how the same song would make one person happy and another person sad. How the kids in Oklahoma were nice to me, and then when we moved to Kansas, I got bullied. How the same, how Sunday school teachers could find completely different lessons in the same Bible stories. 
all of these things started to crystallize around these two little rabbits. Two years later, I read Watership Down, Richard Adams' great best-selling saga of a band of bonnie, brave British bunnies who escaped an existential threat and went in search of a better life. I cried for a week. My mother was like, honey, it's just a book about cockroaches. <laughs> and it occurred to me that my two little foster rabbits, if they could tell their own adventures in, rabbit, in Watership Down style, would tell very different stories. Were their happy early days or hours the source of a sustaining faith in the goodness of the world or a childish illusion to be ripped away? Were the mysterious giants benevolent rescuers or merely a more subtle form of tormentor? Was the tipping over of that cardboard box into that vacant lot a long, long dreamed of freedom or expulsion into a cruel and savage wilderness? Personality is story. A friend of mine is a developmental biologist who works with all kinds of small, labable animals from field mice to fruit flies. And I asked her once how simple an organism can be and still have anything that we could call personality. And she said she worked with flatworms that will either plank on the bottom of the beaker or hug up against the side of the beaker. This is it. This is their behavioral repertoire. This is the big choice you face as a flatworm. <laughs> Being a career counselor for flatworms gets old really fast. She said if you cut one in half, they'll regenerate into two genetically identical, presumably equally traumatized, <laughs> flatworms, very frequently one of which will be a bottom planker and one of which will be a side hugger. Planaria personality, flatworm flair. <laughs> we used to say that humans were the only animals who used tools. Mm -mm. The only animals who made tools, Mm -mm. The only animals who understood morality, the language, the money, art, no. We keep getting nudged off that exclusive pedestal more and more. But we are still the only species that tells stories. We are homo narrativus. Tell me your story and I will tell you who you are. And my story has always been that of the wanderer of the one born in the wrong place who has to travel to find their true home. And when the day came that like Hazel and Fiverr and Bigwig from Watership Down, I too sensed that the place where I was living, Missouri, was not conducive to my well-being, and I lit out for something better, for Boston, for graduate school in psychology to study the science of stories. And that is my story of science. That was Robin Abrams. Robin works as a researcher at the Harvard Business School. She also writes the popular Misconduct Social Advice column for the Boston Globe Sunday Magazine and is the author of the book Misconduct's Mind Over Manners, A Guide to Social Life in 21st Century America. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have our magazine, archives of the podcast, and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel Shapiro. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, Josh McCall, and Raphaela Benin. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Oberon for hosting the show, and to Rabbits for being cute. Thanks for listening. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. 
Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.